All right, so we're talking to May Pang, of course, the subject of the very fascinating documentary, The Lost Weekend. Hi, May. Hey, how are you? So, May, Hi, right, May, I think the question on everybody's mind is, why now? Why get the story out now? Well, you know what? It's been 50 years since this relationship started. And, um, and it's been, you know, people got it wrong. I just let it go. But after a while, you know, there's a point where you say, I've had it. You know, everybody's telling me about my life. They know everything about me, but they don't know everything about me. So it was time. And I was tired of people telling my story. Really, that's what it came down to. But May, you had put out books. I mean, people have heard your story before. Is there more to this than what people know? Well, you know, my, my books are out of print. And... A lot of people didn't read it, didn't get it. And now they're looking for it and they can't find it or it's too expensive on uh, eBay and wherever else. And we're at a generation now where it's really about visual. And I think the, the visual makes it easy for people to access. How hard was it to get these visuals? I mean, you know, you've got Imagine in there, you've got a lot of photos, you got video. I mean, how hard was it putting this documentary together? I think it was a, a, you know, I left it up to the filmmakers. They were the ones, they were brilliant. They went out, they sourced it. I, I gave them what I could give them, which, you know, are my photos, which of course, um, you know, I'm having an exhibition. I'm traveling around the country with a lot of the photos that I took during my time with them. So, you know, it's great. People had never seen some of these photos. And I put out a book with some of these photos and people still said, I've never seen. That's why I said it's a visual time. And so the movie will reach, it will be, a, you know, be there for people to see. Well, somebody who does know everything about you is my buddy Ben over here. <laughs> yes. And I can't wait to speak <laughs> well, to I, him. Well, I, you know, I wouldn't say I know everything. Um, and I always want to know more. But, um, you know, <laughs> I want to sort of get to the chase here. I want to, I've got so many questions, you know. And, oh, and, and they're all sort of in, the, in between the crack stops questions, you know, because I already know. A lot of stuff. So for me, I'm, I'm more interested in about like, you know, the people that were hanging around John and you guys at that time, like Bowie, Elton John, Keith Moon, Harry Nilsson, all these guys, Ringo, all these people that John was opened up to. How did they feel when they were sort of first sort of seeing John for the first time? Or um, were they kind of giddy like new fans? Were they, were they kind of awestruck in a way? And how did John deal with them? and that type of thing. Okay. Um, let me start. I think the perfect person I would say would probably be uh, for about being awestruck was probably Elton. And uh, we met him uh, in 1973. And he was a good friend of Tony King, who worked for Apple. And he happened to be in LA at the same time. And he's the guy that's dressed up as the queen for the mind games uh, a review there that that promo and um it was great because we met him on on my excuse me on my birthday in october of uh, 24th of 1973 so you could see he was he he just loved john whatever john wanted he just wanted to do everything for john and and somebody like keith moon who we met up with john years later it was really nice he turned to me he goes ah this is the John I remembered. And he says, thank you. And he just turned to me and said, just said, thank you. And I, and I thought that was very kind and sweet of him to say that. What did they think of the unique situation you were in? Uh, you know, how did this, this inner circle of rock stars, how did they perceive the whole situation with, you know, John being married, but having a girlfriend? I don't think they even thought about it. It was never a thing that was brought up. It was, I was the girlfriend, I was with John, and they accepted it. And they were very, it, you know, business as usual, I was there. And they treated me uh, respectfully. So so with the um, other Beatles sort of circulating around the time, visiting, coming in to visit, you know, we, we hear about Paul coming to visit, Ringo, even George. And um, you kind of met them all sort of solo um at different times and ha, ha, like, did you get a sense that they really missed John, that they hadn't seen him in a, in a little while and 
could you sense that they kind of needed him in a way or sense that there was like a, wow, like you're here. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll give you a, a perfect incident. What happened? John and I went to visit George uh, during his dark horse tour. And we were at the Plaza Hotel and uh, we were sitting in this suite and they were having a chat. And I'm sitting off to the side, you know, it was, it was George here, John here, and I'm just sitting to the side of John. And all of a sudden he turns around and he looks at John because where were you when I needed you? And he said, I couldn't be there, but I'm here now for you. And then he leaned in and he just sort of looked at him and he said, I want to see your eyes. And um, John took off his sunglasses and he put on his glasses, but of course his glasses are tinted and you can't see his eyes either way there either. And George looked at him and he went, reached over and took the glasses off his face. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, John, just don't hit him, please. You know, because here's a guy that just reaches over and grabs his glasses off his face. <laughs> and he and he just looked at him and he, and he said, and he leaned in. I said, I want to see your eyes. And John just sort of said, do you see them now? He said, yes. And they went nose to nose. He just leaned right in because I just want to see. And he goes, I'm glad you're with her. And he points to me. And then he looks at me and he goes, I'm glad you're with him. That was it. Well, is that They're an like insinu- brothers? Is is that an insinuation though that that Yoko had something to do with the collapse of this group? If what I don't know if it's about collapse of the group, but whatever it was, uh, we didn't use anybody else's name except just at the moment of what is just me and John. So yeah. he was very happy about that, and um, and I was really um, really taken aback. You know, I didn't know. And I was just, it was nice of, of George to even say that. I had no idea. And, you know, um, and I had seen George over the years because, you know, he came into the office uh, in 1970 and I met him then. I met him on various occasions. So it was it was quite interesting. So out of around that time, out of the Beatles, they're all doing their solo stuff. You know, they're all in the charts one here, one there, all going up together, um, but yet not together, but together in a way, being all in the charts together. Um, did you get a sort of an idea of who John was really impressed with charts-wise and well, solo-wise around that time? Like, was I there think- one Beatle or one brother of his that he he was like, oh, he's really hitting it, you know, now? No, I, 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 think, they were, I think he was just curious about making sure, you know, they're still brothers that were still – I think if you have siblings, everybody knows that everybody's still competitive within that circle, but they're not going to say it to each other. But I know John was always concerned about Ringo because he wasn't the writer. And um, he was always wondering, making sure he would he was going to do well. Of course, we wrote, um, he wrote the song uh, Goodnight Vienna for him. And we went out to the West Coast and made sure and, and you know, he, uh, he was there and he participated in it. And he also did give um, Ringo the song Only You, which John himself wanted to do first. And, you know, yeah. and got one song. And he found out while we were there in L.A., in LA here I am now. But, you know, at the time he said, uh, yeah, we shot one song for the album. And John says, I've got a song. I was going to do it. I'll do it. You know, I'm going to let you have it. He arranged it. He got all the boys, he guide vocals, because I know later on it was released, but it was it was something that nobody knew that it was even out there. I knew that it was there and I went um, uh, I went to Richard Perry because he was producing Ringo. And I said, John always wanted to come back to get his copy. You have the guide vocal, you have his vocal <laughs> for the song. And he totally forgot because do I? And his assistant found it later. And I got a copy, but that's how everybody found out that there was one with John singing it. I've I've got his Lost Lennon tapes. I've got that the volume of the Lost Lennon tapes, and it's all the demos and some of the home demos as well. And it's really amusing that uh, he he usually opens up with some of these random songs like this one's for Ringo. You know, he always had Ringo in the back of his mind, and 
And sometimes I think, man, he's probably written this song for Ringo and then thought, this is this is really good. I just want to do it for myself now. But half of these songs he just wanted to write for someone else and then ended up sort of nicking them off himself, you know, <laughs> doing them himself, you know, like why wouldn't you, right? But, uh, yeah, it's, it's great endearing yeah, that he was looking out for yeah. Ringo. He definitely was. And he's always, um, you know, I remember him saying, oh, you know, I am the greatest, for instance. He said, I wrote the song, but I can't sing it. They'll be thinking I'm the most egotistical <laughs> person in the world. So he says that Ringo could get away with it. So that's where that went. He always used, they always used to pass all the songs that they wrote as Beatles that they were too embarrassed to sing to Ringo. You know? <laughs> hey, listen, think about how many hits he got. He was the only one that had more single number ones than, than the other guys. I mean, I've just gone through his whole discography and there's a lot like Ringo now with his solo stuff. And there is a lot of gold. Like I've got my best of John, best of George, best of Paul. And when, when you sift through all of it, like he's right up there with him. You just got to go through it all. But his, his good stuff is, is fantastic. You know, Elizabeth reigns, you know, Ringo's and he's right still going, there. he's right up he, there with him. Yeah. He's still going too. think about it. You know, he's, he you know, he's 83. He's still gone. Was there anything in the documentary? Because, I mean, you know Beatles fans, they're they're itching for new information. They're itching to find out something they don't know. Was there anything in particular in this documentary that when they, when this, when they came across this, you're like, oh, they're going to love this? There were plenty. I, I think I've asked everybody that's seen it. Now, have you seen it? I Yes, I watched it now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, a lot of people were very surprised. They all said to me, I thought I knew everything. And then once they saw the movie, they go, I guess I didn't know everything. And that's the reason why, but I can only fill in for 90 minutes. So there wasn't, there was still that people say, there was still more that I wanted in there. I said, well, it's 90 minutes. It's, you know, even though, um, we put, I think we put in a lot It answered the basic, I guess. But um, there'd be more, I'm sure, uh, later on in time. You told me one what story. surprised me uh, watching it. It's a fantastic documentary, by the way. Really Thank well you. edited. Um, the the hugging Julian at the end, you know, that was uh, that was a real tearjerker. I didn't expect to be getting emotional watching that, but that was just, it did what it needed to do. And it was real and uh, very, very moving. Um but yeah, what what really got me was that you and John were still in contact even up until 1980, and that's something that I didn't know. Um, I know, <laughs> and it got me wondering about some of the songs that he was writing on Double Fantasy, um, and because I always kind of felt like some of those songs, you know, who were they about? Like obviously everyone would assume that they're about Yoko, right? But I, it got like when when I saw that in the documentary, I was thinking immediately. Okay, so they're still talking. Um, are there songs about May up ahead in the game? Um, have you ever speculated yourself about some of those uh, songs? Yes, when I heard, especially Forgive Me, My Little Flower Princess, um, that was one of the songs because it fit. It just fits for the, the situation. There were about mm, a few songs that were written originally um, when we were together and he later rewrote the lyrics that came out of on double fantasy but you've heard the demo but this wow. like, the, the, you know tennessee was about tennessee williams it was certain songs that were already written and then he took the melody and then changed the lyrics so uh because it was all publishing was stuff that he wanted to do yeah there was all these different songs and uh you know as time went on and there was always hidden messages and you have to figure it out, you know, with him. Even I had to figure it out because I'm sitting there listening to it. I'm going, oh, wait a minute. It sounds very familiar. Oh, and here's the thing. Uh, when John and I got together at one point in uh, about 78 or somewhere around there, he came over to visit and he said, there's a song that reminds me of you. And I taken aback and I'm going what's what do you mean and he says I I heard the song and I just think of us 
And I said, what song? So he started humming. And I said, oh, wow. I said, you're the second person that's asked me about this song this week. And I put it on. And of course, it's the Little River Band reminiscing. And the Little every- Aussie River Band. Yeah. <laughs> that one. <laughs> and he said, when I hear that song, he goes, I just think of us. I think of you. So I know there are fans that said, oh, it's impossible. That song came out much later after they, you know, when they were broken up. But they don't realize, like you said, you saw, you didn't know that John and I were still in contact. And that's where that came in. Well, heck, the album was called Double Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Very good. So Sweet Bird of uh, Paradox. Um, I knew that that was about you. And I'd already heard that demo on the bootlegs the acoustic version and like i i actually like the acoustic version better than the studio version it's it's more raw um it's got all of the motion there um he's kind of laid back in that version and i loved it before i found out it was about you and i, I like to do backstories on songs now like, wow that's about may Payne. that's fantastic you know um it's sensual you know um and you can feel it, you know. So when you hear that song now, all these years later, are you like transported back into some sort of time capsule where you can like envision it really clearly? Like what does it that song do to you now when you hear it now? It I'm 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 you know, it's like I'm happy and I'm sad because he's not here. But it's amazing that that the first time that we got together being intimate that's the song he came up with and so it just takes me into another place I just you know when you hear it you know you go he wrote that about me and it's I mean I've never thought about him writing a song I don't ask him don't you know write a song about me so it's it was just so special and it's and you know of course I'll always have that um it's always going to be around me it's always going to be uh, inside my heart. It's always going to be my soul. He's always here. Did you ever get the sense that he was fe- uh, like he was feeling for you? He had feelings for you at that point? You know, I thought he, you know, you, you, it's the beginning. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. It's, uh, he likes me. It's the like. But whoever would think that it was when you hear the song and I heard these words, I love her. It was like, what? where did this come from you know so I still was always cautious in the back of my mind like is it real you know it's just sort of I'm, I was I was always cautious I took my time I got this um this thing I've always wanted to know um is there's this infamous story or famous story about a rock star that butted out his cigarette on a Henry Matisse in the Playboy Mansion. Do you know anything about it? I heard about it years later. I was so pissed when I looked at that and I read the story. And it was at the Playboy Mansion. And I thought, I was there. There was no such thing as John being an artist himself, be taking a cigarette and just say, oh, let me just put it out on a Matisse or whatever it was at the time. <laughs> And I'm following, I mean, you know, I'm with John. So it's not like as if, uh, if you're going to do something, you don't think a million people, there's so many people around that nobody would have seen him do, oh, hold on, let me just take that cigarette and just put it out on a painting. And I found the story um, just wild. And I'm thinking that, oh, Harry Nielsen said to him, oh, well, he's my friend. And so he goes, oh, okay, I'll let it go. And it's supposed to be a million dollar uh, repair. And I'm thinking, I don't care if it was, Whoever it is, it's a million dollar repair. You're not going to tell me that you're just going to let it go because it's your friend. You know, I thought wow. that was. A little... Yeah. Yeah. I, I I mean, what did you think? Do you really think that that could be? I'm standing there. People forget. And that was the thing during a lot of these stories that did come out. And that's an, another reason why, uh, you know, when I did this movie, a lot of people forget that I was actually there next to him. I don't, I don't, yeah. I didn't. Well, right? that's why I asked, because I, I knew you would have been there with him. And I, I just wanted to know a little bit more because I believed it. And I thought, um, 
you know, it's kind of like a crazy rock star thing to do. And I'm so thought, you know, I can, I can imagine that for some reason, you know, wild John being wild, you know, Hamburg days kicking in um, telephone booths and stuff like but that. I, I could that's see it. I could imagine it. Um, but I do have this. Now, and I can't believe I a, found you, there, it. I don't know how yeah, rare it is. Let me tell you, there is a message on the front of that cover. And they tested it on me. And I said, there is. And John said to Harry, I told you, it's too obscure. It's out there. And nobody ever got it until I started talking about it. I'll give you a second to look and you tell me, can you see the message? Take a, a look at the front. Okay. Yeah, on the front cover. I'm going to ask. DNS. Yes, that's part of it. Okay, that's what, that's as far as I got was the DNS. Okay. What's between the D and the S? A mat. No a table. Call, I don't know. We call it we call it a rug. So what does it spell? Drugs. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> I'm just going to zoom this right up here. Oh, that's great. So that was a Harry Nielsen, you know, message on there. That's wow, that, that is very obscure, but I dig it. Okay, so there you go. There was another thing. <laughs> what else you got, Benny? Okay, so um, this one's a little bit sort of proby, you know. Um, it's a little proby, but, you know, we got to talk about this stuff because, like, we all want to know. Um, John said privately that he was the happiest he'd, he'd been while he was when he was with you, and the two of you were going to fly to New Orleans to visit Paul and Linda while they were doing the recording the um, Venus and Mars album. And the day before you guys were to fly out, John allegedly reconciled with Yoko. She said that she had a, a cure for you know his cigarette addic addiction, right. and um, when he came back the next day. He says, I'm going home to Yoko. And you said that he was confused. He looked a little bit sort of stupefied on his face. And your con conclusion mm -hmm. after it was that he'd kind of been influenced. Um, do you still sort of, have you changed <coughs> your mind over the years about that? Or do you still think that he was kind of swayed in a, in a certain way? I haven't changed my mind. It's, it is what it is there. And no, it was, he was leaving. Here's the thing. Cause people have asked me that as you, you know, he's leaving to go down the steps. He goes, Yoko's calling frantically. It's gotta be done today. It's gotta be done today. It's a Friday. And I knew something was up cause I know how things work. And he, and he says, and he just got tired and he said, yes. I said, do you really have to go? He goes, listen, I'll be home early. We'll have dinner wherever you want to go and we'll make the plans and we'll go down to see Paul and Linda down in New Orleans. He was dying to go because Paul and Linda were just at our, our flat a couple of weeks earlier to just, you know, to just tell us what they were doing, their plans. And John was really, really like excited. Oh, that'll be great. And he also asked me right after they had left, what would you think if I wrote with Paul again? Do you think it's a good idea? So it's a no brainer where this was heading. So I was saying yes. And I didn't want, so as he's saying, we'll make plans. We're going to go down to New Orleans. We're going to do this. He goes, I'll be home for dinner. I'll see you soon. I'll be back. And he walks out the door and I said, you had that, that, that gut feeling in the pit of, you know, your stomach and you go, don't think so. And we were about, and we also had put down, we were, uh, a binder, we were about to buy a house also out in Long Island. So all these different things. So people are thinking, oh, it was, um, she knew that he was going back. No, she had asked for a divorce and he had said yes. So this is more on her part than it was on his. So as have I changed my mind about anything? No. So 
there were there. I do definitely... find that refreshing. Yeah. Do. I do find that refreshing because, you know, as a fan, as a John fan, as a Beatles fan, I do get the sense that things have been sort of kept perfect in all the documentaries that have come out. I mean, you know, you, all the famous stories are talked about, you know, the kicking out of the Trabador and, and all of that. But, uh, you know, there, there seems to be this perfect sort of legacy, but life isn't always that perfect. And, and your documentary it throws a bit of dirt around and I like that because it's real, you know, and it's your truth and it's fascinating. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's what it was. It's easy for me to tell the story that I've held in for so many years because it is the truth, what I had to go through. Um, there was no sugarcoating. Um, you know, the thing with the Troubadour Day kept saying, oh, he's done a lot of drugs. He wasn't. He had some a lot to drink that night. That's true. But then people don't realize that night at the Troubadour when we're talking about the same, you know, if he was really drunk during our whole time, he couldn't perform all the stuff he had been performing, you know, getting up there, uh, doing all this music, because he's very hard on himself when he's in the studio. And so the Troubadour, you know, you only read about the same two incidences you know it's not this it's not every night we didn't have you know drinks every night he like a broken record in the newspapers yeah it's the same thing over and over and so it makes it look like it's that old line um you know where uh it's it's one it's one thing or another you know i just saw this thing that popped up i just want you to know that it was definitely um what you saw was what it was and and you, and john was and there was a point he was going to be a divorced man. May, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit to elaborate on that situation when he got thrown out of the Troubadour, because you had told oh, me yeah. an interesting story that I hadn't heard before. Yes, because nobody even knew that. I'm screaming at Harry Nielsen, who's like, he's the ringleader. And he's going, come on, let's heckle the Smothers Brothers. And I'm going, Harry, stop it. And I'm grabbing him because I'm sitting between the two guys. And he says, come on, John, let's do it. And John was easily swayed to doing it. And then all of a sudden, the, the manager comes over from, you know, the Smothers Brothers says, can you guys be quiet? And he goes to John and says, and John sits down, yeah, 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 okay, fine. And Harry gets up and he goes, nah, don't listen to him. He's only joking, you know, and he's going on again. Come on, let's do it. I'm sitting across from Pam Greer, Jack Haley Jr., Peter Lawford. I'm sitting next to all this and I'm going, Harry, stop it. Nobody likes this. And he's going, ah, oh, they don't care. They all love it. I said, Harry, they don't. So, of course, they started all over and they're all drunk. And all these Brandy Alexanders are sitting at the table because it wasn't just for him. Nobody realized it, but everybody was ordering Brandy Alexanders. Everybody at the table. I'm the only one. If you see a Coca-Cola bottle, that's mine. So I'm, I'm sitting there. And again, here comes the, the here comes the Smothers Brothers, the manager, Ken Fritz comes over again. And what does he do? He said he tells John he does, he doesn't go to Harry. He goes straight to John. And I always said, who makes a better copy? Of course it's John. It's not gonna be Harry. So he goes, he goes, didn't I tell you to that you have to stop? And he grabbed by he grabbed John by the collar. And all of a sudden it was like game over. Cause he goes, nobody grabbed me. You know, it's like, I think if, if for anybody in any place, anybody puts your, their hands on you, you, you react. And that's what happened. He reacted. Naturally. Everything yeah. went flying. Wow. That's, um, yeah, that, that's always been an interesting one. Um, so I heard that they were kind of heckling the group that was, was happening. Yeah, the Smothers the Brothers. The Smothers Brothers. And that's exactly what, what were they were they funny when they were heckling? Like was it kind of funny what yeah, they were it was saying? Or was it funny. it was just kind of funny? It was, hey, get off, you know, you're idiots. Yeah. You know? But that was their first <laughs> yeah. you know. And this is and this is Harry Harry led this 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 home. He's trying to get the table to do it, the whole table. And I'm looking at Harry going, Stop it, just stop it, will you? And he goes, No, nobody yeah. loves it. I said, Nobody loves it. But John, John's going to take all the heat because he's John Lennon. So Correct. he's the one that has to answer for it, right? Right. Harry, 
Harry? Who's Harry? You know, it was all John. So that's what everybody recognizes. It was, it was all, it was all uh, John. But it was really Harry who led the brigade down. Let's go and help. Yeah. And they all go to him. And, you know, and the smugglers, but they knew for some reason, they all knew it was Harry, but they didn't go to Harry. They went to John. With um, Phil Spector, um, <laughs> the enigma of Phil Spector, the crazy genius. I mean, you know, Lennon is a genius. Phil Spector, crazy genius on that fine line, you know. Uh, I love his work as a producer, as as a guy, you know, controversial. Um, but I've always wondered, you know, when he pulled out the gun and things escalated and shot the roof and Lennon rebuked him for saying, uh, you know, uh, look, I need my ears, man. You know, if you're going to shoot me, just shoot me, but I really need my ears, you know? Right. And I always wondered, like, what was that over? Like, what was the thing that, like, made him just – what 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 was that argument? How did that escalate? That's a great question. Okay. Here's what happened. We're all listening to playback at the recording studio in L.A. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're sitting there and we're doing playback, and I'm standing next to – Mother Bertha, which is Phil Spector's mother. She had come by the studio and it was amazing. I said, oh my God, she's right next to me. And all of a sudden we hear this gunshot. Now the stupid girl, meaning me, I'm the New York girl that hears a gunshot. Everybody's ducking, including mother, Bertha. And I'm the one that runs towards the sound, not away from it. And I opened the door because it was in the little lounge off the side. And there's Phil with the gun in his hand, like, you know, pointing upwards. And Mal Evans, who was the roadie for the Beatles, the original roadie, he was there and he grabs the gun out of Phil's hand. He goes, you shouldn't have this. And Phil's going, you can't tell me what to do. You know, that type of thing, being defiant. And John's going, Phil, Phil, if you're gonna shoot, shoot me, but don't mess with me ears because I need them. Um. And then, and he goes, well, and I said, Mal, what just happened? And he goes, well, he goes, we were just horsing around and Phil kept doing something that kept hitting Mal's nose. And Mal, he's a, he was a gentle giant. He said, please don't do that because it really, it hurts my nose. And Phil took offense and I'll show you. And that's when he took out, as he took out the gun, it went off. So it could have shot somebody. Wow. Yeah. I think it just caught everybody. It caught off. And we, me and John, you know, we said, okay. I said, is everybody okay? And he said, yes, yes. We all went back to work. So the next day, John and I are having dinner at some restaurant. And I see Mal Evans walking in. And he goes, I said, Mal's here. He goes, Mal, what's he doing? He goes, oh, I'm glad I found you. And I said, what happened? He goes, well, here's the bullet from last night. And John and I went, bullet? What bullet? We always thought that the guns that, that Phil had or carried with him had blanks. We never knew they were real bullets. We never thought in a million years that someone would let him carry a loaded gun. Wow. Talk about the Wild West in the studio. I mean, some of those sessions are pretty wild. Like you hear some of the outtakes and, and uh, the arguments and the changing of reels and the swearing and the drinking and, but well, it did produce some great results. I mean, Angel Baby and Be My Baby. I, I always wondered why they left Angel Baby well, and Be My Baby John off the like rock and roll vocal. album. Yeah, John didn't think his vocals were up to par. And the way Phil records for his, you know, wall of sound, it was hard to pull that apart. So John took, the best that he could out of the lot that was done and um, and left those other two songs. Although he wish he hadn't, he didn't want to, but they were not as up to par as what the others were. So, I mean, Phil came to the studio every, uh, he was always, you know, he was always like an hour, two hours, three hours late. And he would have the liquor. So all the musicians were out of it as well. So it's like, I'm standing there thinking, oh my God, because our sessions, we never had that in New York. Everybody comes in, John would say, I don't care what you do after the session, please try to be straight so we can do the sessions. 
and do this well, and that's it. And so this was all new to us. So he, he's used to those Abbey Road guys in there on the mixing desks doing everything perfectly and, you know, with the Beatles and George George Martin and everyone doing their thing on time. And here we have this madness, you know, out in L.A., you know, with a wild Phil Spector and his gun and the liquor and the booze and all that. Uh, see, I know, again, Very different. it'll always be John's fault because it's John Lennon and it's his session. Phil was very, I, I handled the session. So I was the one who was, who was doing all the production work. It was, it was corralling all these people trying to get them in. The, the first night I kept, we kept saying, Phil, how, how many uh, musicians for the first night? We have a setup for eight, which is a lot. Normally it's five people, you know, guitar, bass, drums, whatever else, about five. And he wouldn't tell us. So the only deal we made with Phil, he says, you're giving me full control, which sort of made me nervous as the producer, because John only wanted to be a singer in the band. He didn't want the headache for everything else. Maybe we should have gone that route. Um, and so we're, he says, yes, he goes, but the only thing I'm going to ask you is that I have my own engineer. If we're going to do it out the West, I need my own engineer. So he said, so Phil reluctantly said, okay. So we brought out the owner, uh, John's engineer is Roy Sakawa. He was the, he owned the record plant. He was comfortable. That's, that was his main guy. Flew out. They have a setup for eight. And the first night you hear Phil Spector session one, Phil Spector session two, and this just kept going. First night we had 27 musicians and they're scrambling now to fit 27 musicians and mic everybody that the way it should be. So we had- Is that a financial nightmare? It was, it was, I'm sorry, what was that? I'm sorry. Is that a financial nightmare to organize? It wasn't so much the financial nightmare, but it was for the sound, if you're gonna do the recording, because you're only doing a setup of eight. And it was like, oh my God, we have to borrow from other studios to get all the sound. 27 musicians. We had a full horn section. We had um, two bass players, three three electric guitars, three um, three regular acoustics, two drummers. So, you know, so this went on. And then two piano players now. But here we had part on the piano. This was great, though. We had um, John's favorite, well, you know, one of his idols as a drummer, Hal Blaine, the late Hal Blaine, who played on almost everybody's sessions, you know, rock and roll, and um, and Jim Keltner. We had part of the group called The Wrecking Crew as part of the playing. So we had um, Barry Mann, you know, one of the famous uh, songwriters, so, you know, with his wife, you know, Cynthia Wall and Barry Mann, they wrote all those, you lost that love, feeling, all those great songs back in the day. And so you had you had Barry Mann on one side of the piano, and you had this other guy named Leon Russell playing on the other side. We had a guitarist named Steve Cropper. We had you know there was all these like amazing people playing, but we had no idea who was coming because we don't know. We had no idea what who Phil um, invited to play, so it wasn't. <laughs> ben, you got a couple more. Um. Yeah. Look, I, I could talk forever. I mean, this is just <laughs> but but awesome. but, but May um, can't. So this is gold. This is this is actual gold. I'll give you, um, I'll give you two. I'll give you. Look, a I'm getting back to uh, getting back to, you know, you and John in LA. Um, just alone. You you going through this new phase together, and um, was it kind of weird having, sort of the the, you know, Yoko calling and John talking to her while you two are sort of in the sort of um, new phase, you know, um, was that kind of jarring or not? Or like, how, how did, how did you navigate that? Yeah, you know, I know people ask is why did you hang up? You couldn't, you know, because if there was a point there, she made him feel like you owe her 
So for me, I just sort of sat back. I didn't want to know about it. And so the myth comes in, they say, oh, I had to report to her. I never reported to her. If we had a conversation, she heard some stuff. She may, I may have said some stuff. John may have said it, but we never reported. But she called us anywhere from one phone call to 20 phone calls a day, morning to night. And if I stopped it, then she would say, how could you do that to me? I'm letting you do this, you know? And no, it wasn't, John had no intentions of going back. And I keep saying that they all thought that she can pull the string and that's why he went back. That's not how he went back. Did you ever confront Yoko and say, hey, look, John's with me now? No, because the fact is it would create another, she knew how to handle. Remember, she is 17 years older than me. She is, she's got different, she had different scenarios surrounding her. She had, nobody even knew when Paul came out to LA. See, John and I really lived in New York, but we were only out in LA for the projects. So while we were out in LA for the um for for doing Harry Nielsen and and Paul and Linda came out, what John didn't know was Yoko actually called Paul and said, Well, you know, we're we're separated, but if he wants to come back home, he needs to court me. And Paul was like, oh, do you, do you want that? She goes, well, you could tell him that type of thing. So John never knew that Yoko called Paul to have him come out to give him that message. He thought, John just thought, oh, Paul's doing it on his own. Oh, we're out here all at, all at once and just happened. But it wasn't that way. That just was straight- all, there's all this intrigue in the back. That strikes me as so strange, though, that here they have this strained relationship. They don't talk for years. And then, you know, the, the, Yoko makes this request and Paul's at right then and there saying, hey, John, how's it going? I think for him, probably at the moment, he didn't know who I was. He didn't know who the next person. So I think he just said, all right, I know Yoko. OK, maybe whatever's going on. OK, let me help her out for whatever that, you know, for that moment. But for, for when we got back to New York. One of our or one of our constant visitors was Paul and Linda. They were our first visitor at our home. Had no idea how they found out where we lived. And then the, you know, it was it was kind of interesting. So we saw them a lot. All right, Ben. Last question. Make it a good one. What's it gonna be? Okay, so um John he, he's he's a like a perfectionist when it comes to writing his work. He takes his artistry and his composition very seriously because he's he's so influenced and passionate um but when it comes to recording he just wants to get it done and then get out of there and he does it so quickly how did he i mean i i I can understand the beatles had a synergy where you know hamburg and all those years together and playing together they can look at each other and know exactly what they're doing and get a recording done in one day like they used to you know before lunch they'd write three hits and record them and go to lunch you know um but in his solo years when you were there with him he was working with people, you know, he didn't grow up with for, you know, 10 years. And yet he was still very quick in the studio, still just getting, just pumping out records very quick. Um, how did he do that with, with these guys? Like, how did he, how was he still able to do that? He knew what he wanted. He could hear, he, he would tell them exactly what he wanted. I mean, a lot of people were surprised. Um, Kenny Asher, who was our, arranger or orchestrator and arranger for us when we were doing the orchestration for things. He would meet with Kenny and say, this is what I want. This is how it sounds. Here, here's an idea. He would tell him, he says, okay. He said he was really surprised. He says, I wasn't an arranger. I was just orchestrating for him. He said, John knew exactly what he wanted. Uh, at one point when he was writing something, he heard, you know, Kenny said, I, I heard something. I, I put it in. And then when he played it for John, he was surprised. John caught it. He goes, oh, I see you put that in. He goes, if it's not good, I'll take it out. He goes, no, no, it fits. I'll let it go. He just knew. So a lot of people think that that's why I said John was not drunk in the studio. Um, We didn't have liquor when we're doing our stuff. That just happened to be in the uh, Phil Spector session because it wasn't really our session was Phil's. (laughs) But I had to manage it. 
You know, that was the problem. I had to wrangle these guys. Now I'm the youngest one there. May. I, it worked out, though. Hence, hence Mother Superior, right? So. <laughs> he did very well with, you know, he was very productive when you were around. And a lot of people saw his face. And, um, yeah, your 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 stake in this history is a very productive one. And um, are you still in the industry? Are you still, you know, um, intermingling with, with people on on sort of you know the music industry level these I days? do I still see some friends but on the whole I've not been doing that I've been doing obviously I spent a lot of time um, now working on this the documentary that's coming yeah. out that's been released don't forget you can catch uh, The Lost Weekend The Love Story available on all streaming <laughs> platforms on October 13th right so I hope to see you I hope to see you there May, thank know. you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Love you, thank, May. You, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll talk again. Bye-bye.